So if you've seen my previous video on Kerberos pre-authentication and the get NP users script from Impacket, you'll have seen that if we have a user account in a domain like this and in their account properties, we have this option enabled, do not require Kerberos pre-authentication. Then from another machine, so if we switch over to a completely like separate machine, this is not a domain machine or anything like that. If we run the Impacket get users or get NP users script, we can specify the domain name, which in this case is that and we can just find any user accounts where this option is enabled. So here we've got two user accounts, and for one of them, let's say the TSTAR account in particular, we want to get their TGT data. We end up with this, which is some encrypted data. So from this section here is all encrypted data that is encrypted with their password. So this user account's password is used to encrypt this. We can then take that information, run it through a password cracker like Hashcat, and get the user's password from this. Now that wasn't meant to be a full explanation of how that script and everything works. I would highly encourage you to go and watch the previous video that I was talking about. I'll leave a link to it in the description. I'd say go and watch that first if you haven't already, because that will explain Kerberos pre-authentication in general, and that'll make this video a lot easier to follow along with. So assuming you have watched that and kind of understood it, what we're gonna do now is take a look at the more realistic scenario where this option is not enabled on an account, because as I mentioned in the previous video, I've never seen this option enabled in like eight or nine years of Windows Active Directory administration. I've never seen it enabled. I've never seen anyone even mention it. So it's pretty unlikely you're going to come across a domain where this is enabled. So let's turn that off on our test domain here for this TSTAR account. And now we're gonna look at a way that we could still get their password. And interestingly, we're actually going to use the fact that pre-authentication is enabled as our method of attack. Now, one big problem with this attack method is that we need to be able to capture network traffic. Now, obviously that's not a situation that you're always going to be in, but if you do happen to be in that situation where you can capture network traffic, or if you've just got, say, a, an existing sort of TCP dump file, where you can examine some existing traffic that just happens to have some Kerberos authentication going on in it, then you can perform this kind of attack. So let's fire up Wireshark and we'll see what is actually going on and how we can exploit it. So what we're going to do to simulate a user accessing a network drive, say they just had a normal network drive in here, they just double click on and it's linked to an SMB share somewhere on the domain. We're gonna simulate that by just using the net use command because we're not running on a domain machine, we're gonna to have to supply credentials. And we're gonna say that we connect to this share and we'll do user is T star at our domain. And then his password is that. Again, this is not something us as an attacker would normally know or anything like that. This is just what's happening on the client machine when they access a share. So their username and password is gonna be used. So we wouldn't see this normally, but we're gonna run a network capture as we do this. Run that complete successfully. And we should see if we filter it by Kerberos that we get all these Kerberos authentication requests. Now this does have to be done with the name and you probably will also need the full domain name after the username as well. If you don't use either of those things, if you just use the IP address here, or if you just did TSTAR on its own, then Kerberos authentication probably will not get used. It will just fall back to NTLM. Again, this is not something us as an attacker has to worry about. This is just what would be happening normally when a user accesses a network drive. So don't think too much about this bit. That was just to simulate a user accessing something across the network. So this is what we would end up with in our capture if we were able to capture such a, a request. And what we'll see is that first of all, it tries to access the share without pre-authentication enabled, which is kind of weird that Windows does that by default, even though Active Directory normally requires pre-authentication. But anyway, it will just get an error back saying pre-authentication required. And then we get this proper authentication request, which actually has the pre-authentication in it. And what we're gonna do is look at the pre-authentication data, so PA data here. And if you remember from the previous video, I mentioned that pre-authentication means that the client has to send the current time encrypted with the user's password to the server in order for the server to treat it as a valid request. So what we're doing here is we're seeing that it's encrypting the timestamp and it's sending it to the server and it's encrypted with AES-256. And that becomes important, the fact that we're using this E-type 18, which corresponds to AES-256, that's gonna change how we have to try and crack this. Because I did find some examples online where they were doing this same kind of attack, but in their example data, the encryption type was 23, which means the RC4 encryption type, which is much weaker and much easier to crack. And you can't use the same modes in Hashcat to crack AES-256 as you can with uh, RC4. So 
We need to use a new mode in Hashcat that's only available in the beta at the moment. I don't know if other password crackers and stuff already have this feature built in. I couldn't find any, but I'm only using Windows. Maybe there's some on Linux that are better. So if we just Google Hashcat beta, and then we download it from here, this is where we can get the version that includes the mode we need. But first of all, what exactly are we trying to crack? It's basically just this cipher text here. So this is the encrypted timestamp, and this is encrypted with the user's password. Now you might remember when pre-auth is disabled, so in the get np users script attack, what we're doing there is we're getting a TGT back. So we send a request without any pre-authentication data, and instead of getting this error back, when pre-auth is disabled, we'll just get the user's TGT straight away. So we'll get this response straight away, which as you can see, contains a ticket and this encrypted part. And this is encrypted with the user's password. Again, here you can see it's defaulted to AS256, but the impact script actually requests that this gets sent in the RC4 format. So again, it's type 23 and it's easier for it to crack. Um, but here, because this is just default Windows doing stuff rather than the impact script requesting a TGT, here it's encrypted in AS256 again. But what I want to kind of stress is that we're basically doing the same attack just on a different thing. What was happening when Kerberos pre-auth is disabled is that we get this TGT back, this data here is encrypted with the user's password, so we can just brute force that offline until we get valid data decrypted and then we've got the user's password. Because basically what happens is Hashcat or whatever password crack you're using just looks through a word list of potential passwords, tries to decrypt this text here with each password in the word list until it gets a specific number of bytes in a specific place that are a specific value because then it knows that it actually decrypted it successfully because there will always be somewhere in all this when it's decrypted there will always be say this byte here will always be f3 and this byte will always be ac the rest of it is going to be different every time but there's some parts of it that will always be the same just because of the format of the data so when hashcat is decrypting it it knows it's got the right password as soon as it finds that those two bytes, again, this is obviously just an example, as soon as it sees those two bytes in the decrypted output being in the exact right place, the exact right value, it can be sort of 99% sure it's decrypted it successfully. So whichever word it was that it was trying in the word list then to decrypt the data with, that's the user's password. So that's how that works. Um, and basically we're doing the exact same thing here, except for instead of doing it with this part here, the encrypted part in a TGT, we're doing it with the actual pre-authentication request itself because that contains some data that is encrypted with the user's password. But again, just to clarify, we can only do this attack where we're getting this information here if we can do a network capture like this where we can actually see the traffic. Whereas with the other kind of attack, if pre-auth is not enabled, we can just send, just arbitrarily, just send requests to the server saying, please send us back this packet here, which contains the encrypted data we need to try and brute force. So this is obviously a little bit harder to perform, but I just wanted to kind of explain that you can still do a very similar type of attack, even with Kerberos pre-authentication enabled. So let's actually perform the attack then. We've got this data here that we've captured from a user successfully authenticating. This is the text that we need. So we'll copy the value of this, and we're gonna run it through Hashcat. Like I mentioned, we can only do this in the beta at the moment, but we're gonna do mode 19900, and I'll explain where I got that from and how I know that's the right one in a second. And then we're gonna paste the hash in, but it does need to be in a certain format. So this is actually probably a good time to show you where I'm getting the information from. Uh, if we search for Hashcat example hashes, you see they have a page on their website, which lists all of the modes and gives you an example of the format the hash needs to be in. So if we search for Kerberos, you'll see we get this one, which is doing the same kind of attack we're trying to do now, but with an encryption type of 23, which is the RC4 encryption, so that's no use for us. Uh, this one, which is not relevant for us, again, it's RC4. This one is what we used in the previous video to crack the data that GetNP users gives us back, because that is an AS response with type 23, which is RC4. Again, because GetNP users requests it to be in that exact format. And uh, if we keep going, we get Eventually, we get to this one here, which is what we want, E-type 18, because if we look in here, we've got E-type here, and we've got a value of 18. So that is the format that we are trying to crack, and it's, yeah, Kerberos, pre-auth, it's exactly what we're trying to do. So if we copy that right up to the bit where the actual hash or the cipher starts, copy that, we'll stick that in Notepad, so we can just work with it a bit easier. And here, this is gonna be the username, so in our case, it's T-star, and then this is the domain, so we're going to put in our scrm.local because that's the name of the domain. If we didn't know that in advance, you can actually find this in the Kerberos data as well. 
So if we look in the request body, we've got realm scrm.local, so that gives us the, the domain name. And then CNAME should be, or is it an S name? No, it's CNAME. CNAME has got the username in, and that's all in plain text. So even if you don't know which user account it is or which domain they're trying to authenticate with, luckily you get all the information given to you in plain text. So that's handy. I don't know why that stuff isn't encrypted, considering it does encrypt some stuff, but it's not. So we already know all the data to put there. Now all we need to do is put the ciphertext to the end of it. So we will just copy and paste this, which again, this is the encrypted value of the current time. Paste that in there, and that should be good to go. We'll just pass that straight into Hashcat. So stick that in there, and then we're going to do the rockq.txt word list. And we'll see what happens. That looks like it's done it already. So there we go, there is the password. You can see right there, there's our password, which was password with zero. So even though Kerberos pre-authentication was enabled, we were still able to get some encrypted data and basically brute force it with Hashcat until we get the right password. So like I said, this is not going to be a super common method of attack because you do need to be able to capture network traffic, but I would say it's probably still going to be more common than actually finding a user account that has pre-auth disabled because you've really got to go out of your way to do that. And again, I've never heard of anyone doing that, but that's not to say it doesn't happen. There will be somebody somewhere who's using that option all the time, but in the real world, I'd say it's more likely, especially if you're doing some kind of physical pen test, or if you've got access to some network captures in general, as users are logging on and accessing shares and stuff like that, you're gonna see some of these requests. So all you need is just a valid authentication request and you're gonna be able to get the password from it. Unless, and this is the counter to both of those attacks, both the, with pre-auth enabled and disabled, the counter is if you have a strong password policy, then when we're trying to brute force this stuff with a word list, it's either going to be impossible or it's just going to take way too long. So yeah, if you have like a 15 character minimum password requirement and complex stuff, then it's not going to be in any common word list that we're using to crack this stuff. And you get the idea. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot harder. So that is the solution to all of these problems really, is to have a strong password complexity and length requirement. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. Just the fact that we can still get passwords even when pre-authentication is enabled, if we can capture the network traffic. So yeah, I hope you found that interesting as well. Uh, there will be plenty more videos coming soon. This one I just wanted to kind of just throw out there before I forget to document it. I have done a blog post on it as well, but I know some people prefer to watch videos. So yeah, more videos coming soon. Whichever one comes up next, I'll see you there.